Thomas King with Bragg's Space Legal Department. I uh, helped with the start of the project in 2010, and I helped move the project into the foundation with a large group of people, including Eileen. So welcome, East Austin. It's a small group, so uh, feel free to move on to this side of the room if you'd like, and we can just keep it a small, intimate session. Uh, my name is Eileen Evans. I'm uh, with HP, and I was going to give a little bit about my history before diving into this um, the, the topic here, just because I think it will put some context around the discussion today. I've had a fair amount of open source experience prior to coming to HP. I've been with HP a couple of years, and prior to uh, coming to HP, I moved uh, and joined HP from Oracle, and I was with Oracle for a short period of time following its acquisition of Sun Microsystems, where I was for 12 years. So at Sun, I had the opportunity to um, participate and work on a number of open source projects and technologies, uh, from Open Solaris to Java to MySQL. Uh, it, I was one of the, the legal experts uh, in at Sun and helped to drive some of the open source strategies that we were um, working on, including when we open source Solaris, I led those efforts and, and drafted CDVL. When we acquired MySQL, I actually stepped out of my role for a year. At the time, I was leading up legal support for the hardware division, but stepped out of my role for a year and focused on integrating MySQL and the acquisition. Uh, that was an interesting experience because uh, MySQL was developed in a number of different countries, more than 30 countries, and it had some really interesting uh, IP issues associated with it, as well as an open source overlay. Then when Oracle acquired Sun uh, in 2009, uh, the EU issued a statement of objections. And at that point, I uh, had the opportunity and was sent over to Brussels for a couple of months uh, and focused on you know, helping to push that through, the acquisition through. And the main things that came up during that was were issues around MySQL. And again, the issues of, of Oracle having control over MySQL and what that would mean from an antitrust perspective. Uh, so I had the opportunity to meet with national competition authorities, members of parliament, and European Commission officials and help drive that to closure. So I had, some, I had a fair amount of open source experience prior to arriving at HP, and then I've been uh, working on open source um, a bit since arriving at HP. I'm sorry? Am I out of camera lens? Do I need to move over? Okay. okay. <laughs> oh, it is. Okay. Oh, thank you. So uh, if we look at open source, OpenStack as a project, as, as you know, we've, we've heard a lot about it this week. It's, it's a, you know, a tremendously rapidly growing uh, open source project. It's, it's grown at a trajectory that I don't know if anyone else has seen in the last decade. I mean, it's amazing how rapidly it's taken off. Uh, there are more than 80, 180 companies involved with it. There are more than 6,000 members. It's really taken off at, at an amazing speed, which we haven't seen before. Um, and again, it was founded by Rackspace and NASA and distributed and contributed as an open source project uh, in July 2010 at OzCon. And for those of you who might not have that historical perspective, I'll take you back in time in just a bit. Uh, so to six weeks before the announcement, before July 10th, 2000, I'm sorry, July 19th, 2010. At that point in time, uh, there was a blog post by a guy named Josh McKinty, and he was a contractor for NASA at the time. He was working on some really cool technology in the cloud space focused on compute. He released a blog uh, six weeks prior to this, in, in the July 2010 time, released this blog post talking about this great new uh, compute offering that he has made available and they're going to distribute it and make it available in open source. The blog post uh, was run across by someone who forwarded it on to someone at Rackspace. The folks at Rackspace took a look at this and said, wow, this sounds really interesting. You know, we're also thinking about releasing some technology 
it's, you know, we're taking a look at this, it's written in Python, it seems really similar to what we're doing, but we've created something in the storage space versus what NASA created was really in compute. And I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be interesting if we combine these two? And following that, they thought, well, let's go and meet with the folks from NASA. Now, as many of you know, the federal government, that might be easier said than done. So we, again, sort of like this perfect storm of everything working together. The guy that it was forwarded to over at Rackspace, Jim Curry, uh, he was the senior vice president uh, handling business development. So he receives the call that's related to him, and he's like, wow, this is really cool. This, it seems like this is a great way we could collaborate together. So it, just coincidence, I mean, Jim Curry's dad worked for NASA for 40 years as an engineer. So he was able to make the connections and get, and actually make the connections within NASA, reach the appropriate folks, and get that dialogue started. So again, you know, that, that how likely is it that Jim Curry's dad worked for NASA for 40 years? So nonetheless, they were able to make those connections. So they promptly got on a plane, a week later flew out to Silicon Valley and met with the folks from NASA. So Rackspace and NASA got together and meet, met. And they started talking, and they're thinking, wow, this is really amazing. It's almost like my long lost twin. These projects are so compatible. They're compatible from a, a tools perspective. They're compatible from a language perspective. This is really amazing. So they got together and they thought, let's, why don't we, since they're so compatible, why don't we decide, we're gonna release this together as one project. And they came up with, this is when they came up with OpenStack. They, um, you know, during this meeting, they went out to dinner, following the meeting, everything's going well. Went out to dinner at this Thai restaurant. And then the bill comes. And given that it's the federal government, you know, I actually worked for the federal government for a couple of years, so I can attest to this. You cannot, I mean, there's certain rules and regulations and what have you, and you can't, it wasn't easy to split the bill. Let's put it that way. It wasn't easy for, you know, Rackspace couldn't pick up the tab because the government wouldn't allow that. So they had to split this bill 20 different ways um, in this Thai restaurant where they'd all shared food. So none of us, they did that, but, but I think it was interesting. At one point, Jonathan Bryce was telling me about this story, and his, his comment was, he said, gosh, if this is any indication of what it's like to you know, try to drive this forward and work with the government, I'm a little concerned. You know? <laughs> but nonetheless, they, they um, ventured forth, and five weeks after that, they actually released the code at OzCon, which is pretty amazing if you think about it, because again, you needed to get the approvals of the Rackspace legal department. No offense to no the <laughs> That was probably the easiest part. Rackspace Board of Directors. But in addition, you needed NASA support, and you needed NASA support from the legal department. And at that point in time, NASA had contributed to open source projects, and they had used open source technologies, but they hadn't participated in an open source project of this magnitude, and actually started an open source project. Those are very different things. I mean, I've, I've been in legal departments, you know, working on open source compliance for more than a decade. Those are really different things to do and get their heads around. Nonetheless, they did um, ultimately get the approval from the NASA legal department, and they got it literally just hours before the announcement and before it was released on July 10th, or July 19th, 2010, so which was pretty exciting. And I think because, again, it sort of shows this perfect storm of everything working together, and um, it was just really amazing if you look at that and, what, and also to where it has grown now just two years later. So looking at uh, the, the licensing models and also the contribution model, for the OpenStack project. This is another area which I find particularly interesting in a couple of um, things. You know, one, again, looking at the story of, of, of this perfect storm and, and working together to, um, to develop and, and uh, distribute this technology. One of the interesting things and key factors here was that NASA, both NASA and Rackspace recognized that in order to really drive broad adoption of this technology, they would need to distribute it under a permissive license provided under a permissive license, such as Apache. Uh, so that, that was a early recognition um, by both of them that this is the way that they would have to do this project. And so again, that was the piece that took quite a while uh, for getting the approvals in place. But the other thing about Apache licensing models, if, if we look, take a look at history of, of licensing models and where projects have, what projects have been distributed under and what kinds of licensing models. If I take a look at um, some of my work at Sun, for instance, when we were open sourcing various technologies and contributing to, to various projects, one of the, the key features that we oftentimes would look at is the fact that, look, if you're trying to create a project and a community, you would need to provide a, uh, an obligation for those contributors and participants to contribute back. You would have to have a contractual obligation for them to contribute back. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. That was sort of the understanding of the belief, I think, if you look back a decade ago. The interesting thing here is what we're seeing with open source projects going forward, and I think Rackspace and the OpenStack stuff is a great example of that. When Rackspace did it under um, the Apache model, I think they were taking a leap of faith 
you could create an open source technology, an open source project, and you would have folks contribute back because there was this obligation, sort of a social obligation, a community norm obligation to contribute back, to be good community citizens, which I think we didn't have maybe a decade ago, but we do have now. And I think this is a great example because what we've seen and, and what, you could, what you could see in the slides uh, this morning when um, in the presentation of, of Troy's presentation, you could really see that there was a huge amount of contributions back from the community. And it was no longer, I think the interesting thing on those slides was it was a significant shift from most of the contributions being by Rackspace versus now Rackspace has taken a much smaller piece of that pie. I think that's, that to me is, is speaks volumes in terms of how to create a project and you can create a project and have contributions back and have that social obligation to contribute back without a forced contractual obligation to do so, which I think is fascinating. The other thing that I think is interesting here is the, the contribution model. And this one is one uh, where I received a lot of questions, both internally and from other companies, as and initially when uh, HP had signed the contrib contribution agreements. The questions really revolved around, um, you know, taking a step back. The, the questions were, were basically um, along the lines of, we could perfect the, the contributor agreement if we just make some slight tweaks to the wording, right? We, we, we could make it better. And I think what Alice shared with me yesterday, she said there were a number of companies who also thought they could make slight tweaks and make it a whole lot better. But what we clearly, it, what we recognized pretty early on was, you know what, we have to go with good enough in the sense that the contribution model, the licensing model, companies, individuals, developers feel comfortable with these, right? And they've been working for many, many years. So they clearly are good enough. So let's, you know, we have to accept what's good enough and go with it and take a leap of faith that the folks in the community are going to be doing the right thing. And as sort of a reliance upon that, instead of saying we need to get the legal terms airtight. So I think that was another interesting, I think, piece of this puzzle as well, is that, um, I, again, huge kudos to, to Alice when we were working with her on this, because again, she uh, was very clear about the fact that no, we're not gonna have any companies, and again, this is when it was controlled by Rackspace, we're not gonna have any companies um, making changes to the con contribution model, which I think was the absolutely right approach. Um, yeah, that was a survival tactic for me, really, because I was <laughs> quite a quagmire to open that up, because you can see if you change something, then everybody else is gonna have something to say about the change, and they'll wonder why, and what, why are you making that change? Um, so we, we try to stay right with them, even when there were questions about what it meant, we pointed back to the Apache Foundation FAQ, if you remember, to clarify the scope of the license. So I think the reason the Apache license works is that people do now understand they have an obligation to contribute back. But I think there's just a lot of uh, insecurity with IP lawyers. If they have to promise to commit something that hasn't been created yet, they can't, they can't do that, they can't let go. They're happy to give it back once they know what it is. So the Apache license removes any insecurity that somebody's gonna think of something wonderful <laughs> and they're not gonna have a chance to look at it before it's already licensed, basically. So um, that helps. So we did stick right within the um, Apache intellectual property model, but we did not stay within the Apache sort of way of doing. So I think, you know, most startup open source projects, you think of developers kind of organizing meetups and starting the mailing list, you know, in their spare time at night, and they're not particularly great at that kind of thing. But we actually um, did it much differently. So we had professional staff, full-time paid positions that are uh, good at business development, media relations, marketing. And this actually, I think, drove adoption of the project at least as much as the Apache licensing and just the fact that people were, you know, it was an idea whose time had come. I think if not for these kind of efforts, we wouldn't be where we are today. So um, that had a lot to do with it. So in the space of a year, we, again, we launched in July 2010. By the summer of July 2011, it was pretty clear that the community was large enough, stable enough, there were enough stable big players like HP involved that were committed that it could actually take over the management of the, of the project. I think also there was a lot of unease about Rackspace being the sole manager, like if something happened to Rackspace, uh, you know, a change of control, what would happen to the project. And I think also people just wanted a clear, you know, legally binding commitment to tell, yes, this is your voice in this community. If you participate, here's, here's how you'll be heard. You, know, you don't have to just kind of trust that everybody's going to uh, take your input and get along. So 
uh, made the decision to move to the foundation, and Lou Mormon announced that in the, uh, at the Boston Summit. And I don't know if you remember, Eileen, but after that, we, uh, there was a kind of a town hall meeting, yes. and there were about twice as many people in there as in here, and there were about 500 ideas on how this should look. Yes, <laughs> it <not> was four. <laughs> very scary. Yes. So it was a very great idea, but as the lawyer, you know, I'm thinking, oh, how are we going to do this? So, um, so two things kind of start working in parallel. First, the, you know, there was lots of conversations going on. And I think it, it took from October to April for it to kind of gel. Um, but the two kind of thought trains that are going was, what is the foundation supposed to be doing? What is their role in this? And uh, the mission of the project is still the mission of the project, right? The mission of the foundation is to support the mission of the project, to promote, empower, protect, sort of a steward, I think like a park ranger is my analogy. <laughs> And then, in, you know, the, so there's the big conceptual conversation, and then there's these nuts and bolts. So who's, how are we going to organize people to do the things that are getting done now? So there was an existing technical um, governance contribution model, and then Rackspace was doing like the business end of things. So how are we going to um, move these to a, a, an independent body and keep all the bases covered? So some of the things that got talked about during this months and months of conversations, Eileen was in a lot of conversations in groups, bilateral, just lots of talking and blogging, but uh, we can take turns on these, I guess. The thing is that um, it's not a blank slate. So there are a lot of things that people wanted to, to look at. Like, for instance, uh, maybe this was an opportunity to consider whether the Apache license was the right license. Should we switch to GPL somehow? Was the technical governance model actually right, or should we kind of radically modify that? Why not, you know, why form yet another open stack or another open source foundation? There's plenty, you know, why don't you fold up under Apache or Linux? Um, tons of different interests, a lot of concern that all these disparate interests could not pull together to um, achieve a final. I think one interesting thing here is what we kind of recognized is early on there were a lot of things that worked exceedingly well within the existing framework, such as I think one of the big key things that worked exceedingly well was really the technical meritocracy and the way the project was run from a technical perspective, in the sense that the reason it was taking off at the rate it was was largely because of the technology and just a recognition around that. And so again, what we looked at at a very fundamental level was, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So in other words, we had, you know, the technical piece of this was working exceedingly well. We had, a, you know, this project policy board which really governed the direction of the project and it was run as, you know, a technical meritocracy in the sense that, and it's still run that way today, but it, it's run in the sense that the folks who are contributing from a code perspective, those are the ones who can vote for the, the ones who are on the project policy board. It's the same with technical committee, but again, we, what we wanted to retain was those are the big pieces that were working very, very well and we didn't want to, you know, basically mess that up. Yes, exactly. So, um, you know, it became clear that the, the best way to move this forward was not to change that at all to the extent we could possibly avoid it, but just to figure out how to move the rack space forward. So when you're trying to think about how do you do that, these are the issues. Like, who defines who's open stack? Is it the technical community? Is it this business in, uh, you know, board that's going to be formed to manage the business end of things? How do you balance between the two of them? Um, there was a, a lot of fear that <coughs> this sort of be taken over by moneyed interests and be corrupted, and whoever wrote the biggest check would gain control of the direction of the project, which um, I don't really, I never felt like that was a big risk. I mean, the huge value, if you try to measure the value, is the platform that's being built, and so for some, there's no way of writing a check even for a half a million dollars begins to give you <laughs> a way to control, you know, that, that platform. So, uh, but we wanted to make sure that everybody felt good, that it wasn't pay to play, going to be driven by things other than technical merit. Yeah, the other thing was during this period of time, because again, this was between October 2011 and basically the, the framework acknowledgement was signed in, in April 2012. So it was a six month period. And I think what was interesting during the six month period was the fact that, you know, there were a lot of really meaty issues being discussed on the mailing list. Uh, Jonathan Bryce and Mark Collier were out doing public speaking with a number of folks. They were doing, you know, uh, WebExes. They were doing all kinds of uh, ways to reach out and talk about what they were doing and the way in which they were trying to do it, and their ideas, and they were incorporating all kinds of other ideas. So during this period of time, they were taking input in, um, from this larger community and also hearing all of these ideas. So again, I think there was initially a little bit of um, flack because there was um, it's sort of an expectation, I think, right after that announcement that, boom, we get a foundation done right away. 
but instead, I mean, it was, I think it was November of 2011, which is like a month later, we were starting to get some, you know, stuff on the mailing list about why haven't we, you know, moved forward yet? Why isn't it, you know, why, why don't we have drafts yet? Things like that. But I think that period of time was really critically important because what it allowed was it, it allowed this, this period of time where folks could talk and communicate and, and hear ideas and share ideas. And it really was a very open and collaborative process during that six month period, which I think was critical and, and I think will help drive and did help drive that the way it was ultimately established as a foundation. Right, I mean, there was a lot of concern that we would make a mistake and slow down the momentum by starting an acrimonious conversation or uh, just get bogged down in the details. And so that was all worked out it took a long time, but it was well worth it. And then we arrived at it finally, before we sat down to make a committee to draft the bylaws, we wrote a short two-page summary of the high points, and all the member companies that were committed to becoming platinum members or gold members signed this framework. And they said, yes, these are the issues that we agree on. We're not going to revisit these as part of the drafting process. Um, that's where we established the three classes of members. So there were going to be eight platinum le level members fund at the half a million dollars a year, and they would commit for a certain number of years, and then would be the gold members that would um, enable entry by smaller companies because the funding was based on a percentage of revenue that they have on a floor, and then the individual member class that would get the entire community involved in the governance on this side of the, the house. Um, and then, so each of those three was going to have equal uh, representation on this board, which means we're going to have a huge board. But, um, but I think that's actually a kind of a unique feature here as well, is the fact that the composition of the board includes those three equal classes of membership. I mean, that's quite unique, I think, in an open source project. And I think that also um, fundamentally was driving the, the key things that we're, we wanted to drive forward, mainly the technical meritocracy, driving this in a very open and collaborative way. Right. Okay. So we all uh, agreed on the framework. These are the uh, companies that signed up. Then we started down the path of the real legwork, um, there were, two, again, two parallel eff efforts going on. So we asked that each platinum committer appoint one lawyer and that the gold committers appoint two or three, I forget which way. Different class. Right, to be a legal drafting committee and really write the whole, you know, the bylaws, write it all out. And um, at the same time, the business leaders started organizing and meeting regularly, and Eileen was involved in both of those. <laughs> Yeah, I did have the opportunity to be involved in both of those, which was really fascinating because I think, and part of our rationale up front was to create two separate sort of parallel tracks. You have the legal um, committee and the legal drafting piece, you know, just following a lot of the legal issues associated with it. Again, you know, more going through the nuts and bolts, the, the bylaws, limitations of liability, typical indemnification, legal issues you encounter. And part of the thought process for separating those two tracks was the idea that if we keep those separate, we will have, the lawyers will have a forum in which to have these discussions about indemnification and limitations of liability and these, these legal issues that, that lawyers, quite frankly, want to have that dialogue about. But to be, to be honest, I mean, sometimes when I've had those discussions in front of clients, they, it tends to raise alarm levels, right? They, they tend to get a little more concerned if you're talking, um, well, I'm concerned about 10 million versus 20 million versus, I mean, so those kinds of things get them a little, can, you know, set clients off. Whereas if you're doing that and you're just having that dialogue with lawyers, you're just, you know, realizing you're working through the legal issues, right? It's just cranking them through and getting them through without positioning, without anchoring it in positions. Uh, so I think that was actually very helpful. At the same time, we had a parallel track going with the business leaders. So um, I was fortunate enough to be able to participate in both of those, which was really, for me, it was a fun and interesting experience because I, at the time, within HP, I was um, in a rotation into the, to a business group. So I was actually wrote business role within HP at that time. So I was um, operating in that capacity. And then I have since um, participated on the, on the board of directors and I'm representing HP there. So it, it was really interesting though, the, the legal um, committee versus the business discussion. And the business discussion, again, we'd have these very open, robust discussions, but I think part of it helped in the sense that, you know, we agreed early on we'd have only one representative from each company. I think that helped significantly. I think in the, the early on there was uh, talk about maybe having multiple representation from each company, but we realized that would be way too large given that there were almost 20 companies involved at that point. So I think that smaller group helped. And I think the working, the other nice thing is as we started to work through issues, we started to develop relationships. We insisted that the meetings be in person. Again, recognizing that we needed to develop relationships if we were going to start working together and continue to work together in the future. 
I think that was enormously helpful um, in doing that up front. And we were able to really grapple some, some pretty difficult uh, issues up front. I think the framework acknowledgement letter, which you talked about earlier with that two-page document, actually helped significantly as well. Because what happened is, again, those some of those squirrely issues around you know board representation, around uh, you know technical committee roles, those things were de decided early on, which helped because we were able to say, well, that actually is dealt with in the framework already agreed on that. Let's not revisit that. And those were some pretty tough issues that we dealt right. with. Right. So the framework set up the member structure, but it also was, it's going to be the Apache team that we license. We're going to have independent technical meritocracy. The funding, we need the funding to, you know, keep the momentum on the business side going. Um, and then the other key question was, who gets to say what is open to? How are you going to decide what projects come in and are a good release or get to bear the, brand, the, the mark, the trademark? And so that ended up was a difficult one to solve, but we ended up dividing, uh, balancing the powers on that so that the technical committee can make a recommendation and incubate, and then they can make a recommendation for promotion. The board has to approve, but the board can't act unilaterally or on its own initiative. It has to get a recommendation from the technical committee to act. So that was another point that we uh, covered in the framework. So um, some of the nitty-gritty challenges we face is Delaware law doesn't necessarily support this concept of an independent technical committee. Delaware law assumes that everybody reports to the board, answers to the board in a you know, completely unfettered way. And this was one of our basic principles. So it was really tough to get everybody comfortable that we could have uh, independence within the framework of Delaware law and that that works. Uh, Mark Radcliffe joined us, uh, I guess, after a couple of rounds of conversations after with DLA Piper and helped us uh, draft the bylaws and keep everything marching along. And that was really helpful because what we did at that point is brought in independent counsel um, who was very familiar with Delaware law uh, because, <coughs> again, if we look at the composition of the, the drafting committee, most of us were not corporate lawyers. Instead, most of us were open source or IP or licensing lawyers. So it was, it was actually helpful to bring someone in who had that corporate experience and experience specifically with Delaware law. And also the other nice thing is Mark Radcliffe has a significant amount of experience with open source. So it was actually a really good um, overlay for his experience. Um, some of the other things we grappled with were how, whether we wanted to try to solve um, uh, patent licensing issues within the scope of the intellectual property policy or whether we set that off to later. So I, basically we concluded that uh, we would not do that as part of the establishment of the foundation. And we included language in the bylaws that said we're not a standards body. If we become one, it will be by amending the bylaws and then we'll have to adopt the policy. So we're, we're working on that now. I think it's a better conversation to have once the foundation was formed and there's a more legitimate sort of group of a way to have that conversation and get a result that uh, we have consensus. So uh, that was a big one. And then just the, the oh. oh, sure, go sure, ahead, Alan. Yeah. No, there was a maybe an acknowledgement that members might have other affiliations and that things might take shape even outside of this forum, you know, but it was just not, there was nothing specific like that. It was just left for approval. Yeah. We didn't, um, we had a little bit, I guess, more on the business side. There wasn't representation on the drafting committee, but um, in the business leaders, I don't, I think there might have been um, representation. Right, Alan, do you want to speak to that? I'm sorry, Alan, do you want to speak to that? You're the chairman of the board. <laughs> Alan's the chairman of the, of the board as well, so we work pretty closely together. Um, as far as currently what we're looking at is a recognition that, yes, from an international perspective, Open Source, the Open Stack is extremely important on a global basis. And I think there's a, a strong recognition among the board of that. And, and that's a, a big piece of where we're moving forward um, in, in 2013. Alan, do you want to add 
slide from the bylaws that say we can internationalize the licensing and the other documents and the membership agreements if we needed to until we would entire, you know, we were, had that flexibility to manage international uh, different IP pol you know, schemes in different countries. Thank you. Um, how are we doing on time? I don't know if I'm going to start it late or running late, but the, the um, we've got a oh, couple minutes. The nitty gritty mechanics, you know, there's three different member classes. You have to figure out how the elections are going to get held for each one and the timing and the board terms, all of that. That was a lot of just <laughs> tedious work. The method of voting. So initially we had thought, well, the board could be elected the, uh, the same way that the technical community elects their representatives using the endorse it voting method. It turns out that that was not uh, used at all that we could ever discover in the, in the, Del in the context of the Delaware Corporation, so people were not comfortable with that, and we ended up going with a more traditional voting model, which created some extra work and um, discussion. And we did elect the first board, trying to find a, a service that could manage to Delaware law, <laughs> cumulative voting. That was a bit of work for Jonathan. We had a lot of conversations about how open the individual membership should be. Should it be open to anybody who showed up and wanted to join, or should there be more uh, stringent requirements? You know, we tried to balance inclusive with anti-abuse things like saying you can never have more than two individuals serve on the board that were working for the same, you know, controlled um, sets of companies. And, you know, that everything was going to be open and the openness in the elections and the results and the voting would help uh, prevent sort of some of the abuses that might come, up, uh, come about because you had this inclusive, open, uh, individual membership. And I think that was a big piece of, of the discussion as well, just making sure, because again, we wanted to have broad diversity on the board, and what we recognized early on is if we allowed more than two directors on the board to be from the same affiliated company, um, then what we would be doing is basically negating what we were trying to accomplish at a high level. So we wanted to make sure we had that intact, and that was a very big piece of it. The other piece of it was, you know, making sure that the, the balance of the board, because there was some you know, discussion about, well, what does that mean, gold membership versus platinum membership? Do they get different rights? And what we decided as a board was, no, we don't want to have different rights. There should be no different rights among any classes. Instead, if you're serving on the board, you're serving on the board. And the board is all is one entity. We're not going to have these different constituencies on the board that, are, that make up these different groups on the board. Yes? Why the three different classes? And it was mainly because of monetary concerns in the sense that the first two were because recognizing that if we put the stakes too high, because there was some initial complaints on the, I think initially there was a discussion about you know, what does it take? Because again, we recognized we needed funding to actually make this thing successful. But if we had only one class, then it would, what it would do would be the, the smaller companies and things like that who couldn't maybe afford to, to contribute and participate at that level, that that would be unfair to them. So what we did is tried to create something where, you know, you could have, and then again, what we realized is that even if smaller companies are contributing less, they still have the equal you know, they're an equal director on the board as well. We're all created as one board and one entity, and that was one of the fundamental principles, too, that we had locked the vote on early on in the, the business leaders' discussions. It was a good question, though. Um, so we did. We finally had all these conversations. I think we went through six drafts. I don't know how many meetings the <laughs> business leaders had, and we finally did arrive at, like, July, middle of July, at a final set that everybody was willing to sign off on, and no further comments were made, so we um, published them set a ratification threshold, you know, it's X platinum level people committed and X gold, and I think it was 200 individual members, you know, indicated they would sign on to this scheme that we considered ratified, and Rex basically had to move, you know, move the uh, project assets to the foundation, so that happened very quickly, like within a few days, I think, right? It was, yeah, within 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was, uh, again, the OzCon was going on, yes. so we went ahead, and a lot of the, uh, some of the folks were there, so here's some of my uh, homegrown pictures here. But there's Simon signing his membership agreement. There's Boris Rinsky. Mm -hmm. yep. There's Chris Kemp. Yep. And uh, the, the board, the first board met, well, they had, we held the election. The board first sat August 28th. August 28th. And very shortly after that, we wrote up the asset transfer agreement. And there's Jim Curry after he signed the uh, agreement transferring the trademarks and the other assets to the foundation. There's me. Alice. Goodbye. <laughs> and that, uh, there's our trademark specialist who did a ton of work over the years to <laughs> manage all these things. So these are lessons learned. I get, I mean, I'll let you take this. Okay. Yeah, so we, we've talked about some of these as we've gone through, and since we're a couple minutes over, we'll 
work through this fairly quickly. But again, I think that open dialogue period was incredibly helpful in the be beginning. I mean, from that time frame of October 2011 until April of 2012, that six month time period really helped us to work through some nitty gritty issues. The other thing that I think has been, um, that I think it allowed us to do, and this is something that I, I wasn't, you know, kind of cognizant of at the time, but it also allowed us to work and start working together very closely. So the business leaders, um, the folks on the business leaders who could participate at the business leader level, by and large, almost ultimately became board of directors in the sense that almost every company appointed the person who participated at that level as their representative on the board. That was extremely helpful because at our first board meeting on August 28th, it went really smoothly. And to be very honest, I don't think it would have gone so smoothly and we would have been able to go through so many issues if we hadn't spent that time together in person working through really tough issues during a, a very short period of time. So again, I think that was you know a, a great benefit, which I didn't fully appreciate at the time. Uh, the other thing is, you know, again, the small committee I think was very helpful on the legal side because you know what both Alice and I recognized early on is you know we've both been doing you know legal stuff for a long time and recognizing if you get 20 lawyers in a room, it's going to take an awful long time to do something. So we get a smaller group, much more efficient. So we recognized that early on and figured out a way to, to work together and kind of a cadence for working forward, which was very helpful. Yeah, we just figured it out. Just kidding. <laughs> Again, the, the parallel tracks, I think, was, was actually quite helpful in retrospect. I mean, having the, the legal track, and again, lawyers focusing on some of these squirrely legal issues, and then having the business leaders really kind of delve into the issues on the business side. And one of the, the ways that we actually overlap the two groups is during every business leader meeting, we would have a, a lot or a, a, you know, have at least one hour where we would invite the legal folks in and kind of talk to them about what we were discussing during the meeting, just making sure that we were all aligned. I think that alignment actually helped as well. I mean, some of those meetings would go on, some of the calls would go on more than an hour, but, but nonetheless, it allowed us to at least um, communicate across, which right. was helpful. We got a little stuck sometimes in the drafting committee. We were able to immediately talk. The business committee was meeting the same day we talked, and we got a decision in the middle. Yes, so it was, exactly. It was right. excellent. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Um, so the next thing uh, for the foundation, what's coming up next? We need to address our patent risk. We need to flesh out our intellectual property policy. We have Keith Burke out here from the OIN who's going to speak at the next session. I don't know what our timing is, but in about 10 minutes to talk about the experience in the Linux community and some of the issues that we kind of stayed. Thank you. Oh, questions? Just assets. Right, just assets. OpenStack, with Rackspace, they formed an entity called OpenStack LLC to hold the assets. That ha that entity transferred the trademark and other things and uh, no liabilities to it. So it does. I don't know if we'll eventually. I think the idea is let's have it exist for another year period as we go through the wind down process, just in case there are any lingering assets or things that need to be transferred um, at that later point in time. But we figured a one year period might be appropriate. You ask if OpenStack LLC still exists? Yeah. I'm sorry, we should have repeated that. Sorry, Alex. Anything else? Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye.